Hello everyone. Thank you for joining in our adult online Sunday school class for the week of May 23rd. Thank you for joining me in the Word today. And as always, I want to say thank you to Brother Gene for giving me the opportunity to share in the Word with the saints and anyone else who has decided to join in and study God's Word today. So we are on the lesson series of Thriving in Babylon. And the title of our lesson today is Standing Strong, Standing Strong. So this challenge has been around since the beginning of the church age. We Christians have faced persecution and opposition since the church began and it continues in our world today. But the thing is, the word has called us to be strong in the Lord and one, if not, the most effective way that we can do this is by applying the armor of God to our lives as it's, as it's mentioned in the Word of God in Ephesians 6, 10 through 11, and I'm going to read that for you. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So the, the scripture not only tells us why we need to do this, why we need to know and understand the application of the armor of God, and that is to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, what are wiles? Wiles can be described as ways to trick, to ensnare, to deceive. Um, it can be devious or cunning strategies. It can be manipulation, persuading someone to do what one wants, or to lure or to entice. Those are wiles. Those are the ways the enemy uses to push his plan forward, which is to kill, steal, and destroy. But our big lesson idea for today is Though we live in a world that is hostile toward our faith in Jesus Christ, we must stand for what is right, even if we have to stand alone. So we're going to pray, and then we're going to get into our um, Bible study. Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity to share in your word today. God, your word is true, it's stable, it's sure, and Lord, I pray that through this lesson, Lord, that others can be edified, others can be built up, their faith, Lord, can be made strong so that in this day and hour, Lord, we can make a stand for you, for what we believe in, and for who we are. Lord, be with us in this lesson today. Bless those who are watching, and we give you praise and glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. So the last lesson I did only took me about 20 minutes to do. This one's gonna be a little bit longer because it's a little bit different of a lesson. But first I wanna talk about what kind of what's going on in the world today, just very briefly and very general because this lesson has a lot of information that I wanna give honor to. There are many different tools, there are people, there are devices, there are spirits that the enemy is using to accomplish and to push his plan forward. And like I said earlier, that plan is to steal, kill, and destroy, as mentioned in John 10 and 10, and to wear out the saints of God. Now, I would like to expound on that a little bit, but for the sake of time for this lesson and honoring this lesson, I won't. But that is something that is going on, and there's full-fledged attack to wear out the saints of God. But some things that come to mind, you know, of tools and devices that he is using currently are the media, the education system, the government system, even movies that we think are safe for our children to watch. You know, Disney movies, um, older and newer, there are, there are subliminal messages in those types of, of tools the enemy is using, even toys. I don't know if they're still on the market, but there were these laugh out loud dolls that became popular here and here recently, but parents found out that whenever their children would submerge these dolls in water, that inappropriate clothing would appear. That's enticing, that's luring, that's deception. And then there's Facebook ads. <laughs> 
the, the pressure to conform, the pressure to compromise, and that lures under the shadow of being a racist or hater if you don't. The fear of offense. We could talk about these subjects. We could do whole Sunday school lessons on these subjects. Um, and I really like this one. The my truth ideology. As long as it's your truth, we support that. We support, you know, what is true to you, what what make, you know, what is right in your eyes, so to speak. But I'm going to blow that up right now. In Jeremiah 17 verse 9, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things, above all emotional things, all spiritual things, all physical things. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Not you, not me. We don't really know what our heart is capable of, but there is good news. And though we live in a crooked, broad, and wicked world, the word says in Romans 5 and 20, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, praise God. So there is work to be done, and it's going to require us standing strong, knowing the word, and being suited with the armor of God to overcome and lead others in the battle for the soul. Something real quick I want to share with you personally. A few weeks ago, I was in prayer. Actually, I was just meditating. I was meditating on the Word of God. And the Lord directed me to read Haggai 1 and 4 and Haggai 2 and 4. And he spoke those verses specifically into my spirit. So, I, you know, I immediately went and got the word and I began reading them. And I'm not going to read them to you for the sake of time again, but I encourage you to read those verses. And this is what the word spoke to me whenever I opened his word. It, he said to me, it is time to be strong and work for I am with you. I don't know if anyone else, I, yeah, I do. There are others that are feeling and sensing what I have been experiencing in myself for quite some time now. I've talked with some of you about that, but there is a yearning, even a groping, if you will, for, for a spiritual awakening or a move that my eyes have not seen and my ears have not heard. And I can't even imagine and I can't even hardly, I can't explain it for something of the Lord that, you know, we haven't obtained yet. And maybe it's just, maybe it's just a calling. Maybe it's a transformation. Maybe it's just me yearning for my heavenly home because I'm going to tell you right now, I don't belong here. More than ever before do I feel like a stranger in this world. And I believe that's the way uh, Christians and people of God should be feeling. But I just encourage you, if you're feeling that way, don't ignore it. Pray about it. You know, let God lead and guide you. Let him order your steps. Seek, the, seek and remember the old paths. You know, I know that in my home, we are changing things up. We are seeking him and seeking to please him more than ever. And I encourage you to do the same. So this lesson, it covers an excerpt from the book on the life of Andrew Urshan. He was a missionary to Persia, which is now what we would say was modern day Iraq. So bear with me, I will be doing a lot of direct reading from my lesson because I wanna give honor to his experience and I want to share in, in what he did to stand strong in his faith. So before we get to Brother Urshan's experience, there were three young men in the Bible that made a stand, and we're gonna really we're gonna discuss that a little bit at the beginning of this lesson and just a little bit at the end. But that's the three Hebrew children. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they would not serve Nebuchadnezzar's gods or worship the golden image that he had erected. And even when being threatened to be burned alive, their response revealed their courageous faith. 
So let's read Daniel chapter 3, verses 17 through 18, which is our scripture focus. The word says, If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So this is one of the Sunday school lessons that I could remember pretty vividly as a child. You know, with the burning fiery furnace and all this stuff going on, you know, it really, you know, spurred the imagination as a child. But the three Hebrew children being cast into the fiery furnace only to come out alive, they came out free because when they were cast in, they were bound. They came out, their hair wasn't singed or their clothing wasn't changed. They didn't even have the smell of smoke upon them. Now I can tell you right now, one night out at the family camp out, sitting around the campfire, my hair will smell like smoke for the next 10 days, whether I wash it or not. Well, especially if I don't wash it, but even if I do, I can still smell smoke in my hair. So that in itself is a fantastic miracle to talk about. But anyways, this fire, it was so hot that the men who threw the three Hebrew children into the fire, they were slain instantly. And even that in itself could be, some of you ministers could preach about that, you know, beware of the backdraft or, um, you know, don't put your finger, your hands or your tongue on the children of God. And that's just something bonus for this lesson. But anyways, the three were cast into the fire, and Neb but Nebuchadnezzar, when he looked, he saw four men loose walking in the midst of the fire with no harm. And let's read Daniel 3, verse 25. He, Nebuchadnezzar, answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So he is with us. He is with us even when we walk through the fire, as found in Isaiah 43 and verse 2. So for the accounts of fiery trials to be meaningful for today's believers, their first had to be bold people of faith, willing to risk all to demonstrate the genuineness of their commitment to God. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, after all, say, but if not... Under no circumstance would they bow or worship false gods. I know that where I work at the hospital, I work with a lot of foreign doctors. And one in particular is of the Muslim faith. And on Fridays, you can't find him until afternoon. Because we know that on Fridays, this doctor will always be in prayers till noon on Fridays. And he also participates in a yearly holy month called Ramadan from like mid-April to mid-May, which they fast, I believe it's from sunset to sundown, and then at night they feast. Now, what does this have to do with persecution or opposition? Nothing. But it has everything to do with standing strong. It's the commitment and the consecration required for what he does that earns my respect and attention. You know, Christians aren't the only ones that um, are making bold statements and sacrifices for what they believe. You know, it, I, it, I think that we Christians could actually learn from non-Christians as we look at the sacrifice and, set, and ceremonies that they participate in to support their faith. But we're going to talk a little while about one of our great apostolic missionaries, Brother Andrew Urshan, and a particular account of how he chose to stand strong in the face of persecution in the early 1900s. So, it was in Shirabad, Persia, that Urshan's ministry created such a stir 
that Greek Catholic priests presented a petition to the government requesting that he be sent back to America. He was already getting attention from the religious world. But Urshan and three others who followed his ministry were brought, they were brought before the government and imprisoned because of this. And so one night a telegram arrived from the American consul asking if there were a legitimate reason to imprison these four men. And so immediately Urshan was released, but he refused to go unless the other three men could go with him. And in the end, all four men were released. So right there is a lesson in itself. Not only must we stand strong, but we must stand strong together. Urshan continued his ministry and the Lord showed him a horrible, horrible judgment like a massacre that would be coming to Persia. He began to warn people and his warnings were ignored. And as he spoke publicly about the coming judgment, it was reported to the Russian authorities that Urshan was prophesying the Russians would be defeated by the Germans and Turks and many Persians would be killed. So this was reported to suggest that Urshan was a spy for Germany. So already his message was getting mixed up and uh, a plan was, you know, being put into place by the enemy. But since Urshan was a citizen of the USA, he considered returning to America in order to escape death. So Urshan got his passport signed and it would allow him to obtain passage to the Russian frontier but as he walked away, he was going to leave to escape death. He heard a still, small voice warning him of the danger of being a hireling. He was shocked by the loving rebuke and prayed, O oh Lord, I am not the hireling. I haven't come preaching for gain. I am not leading other men's sheep. I will not run away, but will stay with sheep that thou hast been pleased to give to me. And if I die, then I will die with them. So after his decision to not return to America, Urshan sensed the Lord directing him to Giagtapa. I hope I'm saying that right. I looked, I tried to look it up, but not even Brother Google could tell me how to say it. So I'm just gonna make it up, I guess. <laughs> it's called Giagtapa. It was a small village that would end up being burned and completely plundered during this invasion. So after he turned his back on the idea of going back to America and journeyed toward this village of Giagtapa, Urshan anticipated martyrdom and his heart was filled with joy. With joy in anticipation of the great crisis he was about to face. So, but, so upon arriving to this small village, Urshan preached Christ the Savior, the Healer, the Baptizer, and Coming King. He was there for four months and about 170 converts were filled with the Holy Ghost and power, and a great many more were converted in secret. So the accounts of Urshan's ministry in Giagtapa end with the words, and then the massacre came. So Urshan's life was in danger. He was physically located in the center of carnage. He and about 75 others in that town prepared to face martyrdom. They had already settled within themselves that they were going to die for their cause. They were going to die for the Lord. But Urshan declared, We could truly say we love the name of our Lord to such an extent we did not mind even being trampled under feet of the horses of those wild murderers and even being thrust through with their bayonets, which is a blade at the end of a rifle, all while standing and calling on the name of the Lord. So this is what they were prepared to do at this point in time. They knew that the impending, you know, devastation was coming, but they were prepared to give everything for their, for their Lord. So during this time, Russia was the stabilizing force, and but they had decided they were going to flee. The Russian army fled, and that left the Kurds and the Turks free to attack. 
So the Muslim neighbors of the Christians in the area were preparing to plunder and kill all the Christians. When Urshan heard the news that the Russian army de had departed and the impending attack of the Kurds and the Turks was fixing to take place, he prepared his followers for martyrdom. And they began to pray and sing under the blood. <laughs> In my mind, the peace of God and the love of Christ is, is really what kept these early Christians from surrendering to the wiles of, of their attackers. It's going, to, it's going to take a surrender to be able to stand. It's going to be, you're going to have to surrender to God's plan, to God's will at any cost. We need to also stand together as individuals, as family, church, as a community of believers when we are faced with opposition to our faith. So the Russians had fled the scene, but they left behind some ammunition. So the people of the village of Giagtapa, they used this, the ammunition that was left, you know, in attempts to ward off any attackers, but they could only accomplish this just for a few hours. And then the Kurds and the Turks, they gained entrance into the village. During all this havoc, Urshan and his believers, they were found in a house praying. And when, when they heard a knock at the door, they were really frightened at first. But Urshan soon realized it was one of his young believers. She, he pulled her inside quickly, but she compelled him to come. She had something to show him. So she led him away to a street that was quite a distance away. Urshan followed the girl and of course, there were bullets flying everywhere, all kinds of carnage taking place. But they made it, and she brought him to a large room where there were people lying unconscious on the floor. There were people weeping and wailing for what was about to happen. But she continued to lead Urshan through this room because over in a corner, there was a young girl shaking and prophesying under the power of the Holy Ghost. During all of this you know, mess that was going on. And Urshan knew, whenever he saw this, he knew that God was with them. So he went back to the house where he came from, you know, again, passing through flying bullets and, you know, escaping death and escaping injury, escaping being caught. Um, he got back to the house where he came from and he told his believers that he just witnessed and affirmed to them that God was with them. The believers heard at that point, after Urshan had, you know, confirmed what was going on with the group of believers, you know, a few streets away, the people in the house where he was, as they were praying and preparing for martyrdom, they heard soldiers, you know, beating down the doors. They heard piercing screams going on. And Urshan, he realized, you know, he was responsible for the safety of all these believers, all of these people who he had converted and he had won to the Lord. And the believers, they told him, they said, Brother Urshan, if you run away, we will run away with you. But if not, we will stay here and die with you. There's that phrase again, but if not. Like we read from the three Hebrew children's encounter, it indicates that at whatever cost, we are going to stand strong for truth and what is right. So at that point, Urshan chose to flee with the believers from the village of Giagtapa to a place called Ermia. So that was, their, that was their destination at this point, is to go to Ermia. So with about 75 people, Urshan left Giagtapa. And after only going a short distance, they were surrounded by men with these machine guns and spears. And, and Urshan, he just felt compelled, just instantly compelled to run in front of these people with his hands raised, throwing, Jesus, Jesus. And whenever he did this, the armed men on the horses, they immediately surround him. And Urshan just fell to his knees. But then he was just commanded to rise. And they only asked for the people's overcoats. And they did it in kind of a friendly way. And they also told Urshan to take his followers and go a different direction because they would be safe. 
Again, God is with them. So having expected martyrdom and the opportunity to see the face of Jesus after sealing his testimony in blood, Urshan was a little disappointed having missed the privilege of dying for his precious Lord and Savior. To me, that is sold out. That scripture, buy the truth and sell it not, this is what it's all about, is just, you know, believing it, living it, and dying it if you have to. So as they hurried in the direction pointed out to them, they saw people being slaughtered by Muslim neighbors. And dur during all of this, you know, thrashing that was going on, there was this individual that, that was involved in these slaughters. He rushed towards Urshan and with these blood red eyes, and Urshan greeted him in a Turkish language, and he said, God's mercy be with you. And Urshan was then led by the Spirit to confess to this man the sins of the nation of Persia. So after Urshan affirmed to this man that he and his group were genuine Christians, the man seemed moved to almost weeping. And he told Urshan, he said, young man, I am going to deliver you. I will give my life to take you safely to the American quarters. This young man told Urshan the American flag was flying over a compound in Ermia. He told Urshan, I could take thousands from these Christians. Their houses are left and I could rob them, but I don't want anything. Just follow me. I'll lead you to safety. Again, God was with them. In the year 2019, the U.S. House of Representatives voted to recognize the Armenian genocide of a century ago. So back up to the story of the three Hebrew children. When Nebuchadnezzar realized the God of the Hebrews was the only true God, this is what he declared in Daniel 3, verses 28 through 30. He said, then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver out of this sort. So just as this young man who ran up to Urshan was compelled to, instead of hurt and devastate Urshan and his group, he helped them. Nebuchadnezzar, his mind was changed as well. So the exaltation of people of faith to positions of power and influence is not an uncommon theme in scripture. We can think about Joseph, second in, second in command in Egypt, Moses, leader of the children of Israel, Esther, she was made queen and saved her people. And then of course, Daniel and the three Hebrew children, they eventually rose to, power, to positions of powers of, of authority in Babylon. But Esther, she tells the story of Israelites who were taken captive by Assyria in 722 B.C. And it was due to Israel's adultery. But in the midst of this captivity, Esther came onto the scene for such a time as this. And through a miraculous turn of events, her willingness to risk her life, she became queen and was instrumental in saving the lives of her people. Daniel and his three friends, when they were in Babylonian captivity due to the rebellion of the people of Judah and because these three men were willing to risk their lives to keep their faith, they also rose to positions of authority and power. Some of, me, some of you may have come to faith in a hostile environment. I know that whenever I was really young in the Lord, learning and growing, I faced opposition. I faced opposition in my own home. You know, there weren't flying bullets and there wasn't near martyrdom, but there was pressure. There was pressure from unbelieving family. Pressure, maybe there was pressure from unbelieving spouse. 
You know, maybe you have experienced the snarls, the stares, the whispers of once friends, classmates, or coworkers because you've changed. But now because you stood strong and you kept the faith, um, you're, you now find yourself in a position of leadership or authority. Maybe you're a pastor, maybe you're a teacher. But despite opposition, you chose to stand strong while in your Babylon. So back to Brother Urshan, before finally reaching Ermia with his entourage, there were passing flying bullets and horrifying sights. Urshan described it like this. We saw terrible sights all around us. People were being killed and stripped naked, dead bodies everywhere, and wild dogs were eating their faces. Young girls being taken away from their parents, young wives from their husbands, but not one of the young women around us was touched. We were about 75 souls wonderfully kept and delivered from death by the Lord Jesus in whom we trusted. So this group of people, they're on their journey to Ermia. They, they climbed walls, they waded rocky streams, they crossed vineyards and trudged through hills and valleys, and they finally reached the walls of the city of Ermia. They had to pass through thousands of Muslims gathered around the walls of Ermia waiting to capture and kidnap Christians. But when they saw Urshan's group of boys, girls, men, women, they rushed up to them and they shook their hands and they told them not to fear. This being the exact opposite of what they expected and it caused Urshan and his group to weep and to shout for joy. The Muslims led them to the American compound. After the massacre occurred, the survivors experienced very, very unsanitary conditions. Many died from typhus, including Urshan's mother. Urshan himself contracted typhus while caring and ministering to those who were sick. And while praying for his niece, he felt virtue leave his body and sickness enter. But the girl was instantly recovered. He became very ill, losing all his hair, his skin peeled as if it had been burned, and his fingernails, they fell off. He lost almost all of his eyesight, his hearing, and he was bedridden, and he was bedfast for 36 days straight. So during this time, many attempts were made on Urshan's life when he was in Persia. He, he was expected to die on five separate occasions. Mobs tried to kill him, but the power of God would come upon him and he would sing. Seeing he had no fear of death, no one would touch him. He was 29 years old when he arrived on his mission to proclaim the gospel in Persia. He spent two years in Persia and Russia and in the face of intense opposition was able to establish works that are enduring to this day and even reaching beyond places of their origin into other nations. So the word clearly indicates that if we choose to follow Christ, we will suffer. In 2 Timothy 3 and 12, it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Self-denial or persecution is our cross to bear. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And finally, 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 14 tells us, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice! inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rested upon you. On their part he is evil spoke of, but on your part he is glorified. So no matter what we face as Christians, people of faith, no matter how violent it may be, no matter how subtle it may be, while we are standing strong, we are glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ through it all. We will face opposition, 
maybe even persecution on our walk with God. And if time stands, it's uncertain really how violent or deceptive this may present as. But we are encouraged today to keep the faith, to endure sufferings, to love Him more than our own life and be willing to surrender in order to stand. I hope you have enjoyed this lesson today. A couple of thoughts I want you to think about this week um, as you you know, med meditate on this lesson. Think about how your faith has been tested or tried and how did you respond? And in what ways can you continue to make a stand for your faith? Especially in this day and age, when everything around us is falling down and failing. I remember a few years ago, I heard my brother say this. He was going through a really tough time. His world, you know, was shaken up. And he said, there is nothing sure in this world but the word of God. Anything can fail. Anything can change. Anything can be shaken. But there's the only thing that is sure is the word of God. And that has always stuck with me. And one more thing I want to leave you with is what the Lord so gently spoke to me that crisp Tennessee morning a few weeks ago. It is time to be strong and work, for I am with you. Thanks for watching. Stand strong, and God bless you.